kit is amazing, but it also old, very old. It was built for developers that had to send patches with code changes over email. It was initially created by Linus when he worked on Linux and then passed to someone else who actually did most of the work. Git has almost 150 commands, 82 of which are the core and only 44 are the main ones most of you know like commit, push and pull. It also comes with manipulators like config and reflow. It comes with interrogators helping you to blame your friends with, well, blame but also commands like git re re re, which we'll check out in just a bit. Today, we're going to check out a few features you always had but are very uncommon and some fresh new additions that can save lost work, a lot of frustration and hours of fixes. The idea for this video was inspired by a recent talk gave by Scott Chacon, who's one of the founders of GitHub. He gave this to students earlier this year and he's also working on a new Git interface called Git Butler. I've got my own take about how they do things, so if you're curious about that, just stick till the end. With that in mind, let's dive right in. Git config is where you set your, well, configurations. Git config minus L lists everything locally, whereas minus minus global flag grab global configurations. Let's find our global config with the minus minus list minus minus global and show origin flags. This is nice, but it can do cool stuff. For one, it has global settings that you can list with the global flag and also local settings per project. You may have already known that, but even if you did, did you know that you can actually set conditional configs? Let me explain. Until learning about this, I would have a global email address set for all of my repos and specific email address, usually my work ones for work projects set locally, but I'd go through them one by one. With conditional configs, I can tell the global config to actually include another configuration file if the path matches my work projects, for example. Note that I'm using a relative path and this works on Mac and Linux. If you're a Windows user, I believe you'd need an absolute driver path, but it works the same. Also important to note that you want this configuration to follow other lines in order for the configuration overriding to work as expected. Now that I have the include line added, let's go to my work folder where I have another simple config file with a different name and email. If I go into some project under my work directory and I fetch the current user with git config user email, I can see that the email was overridden with the work configuration. With this setup, I don't have to worry about setting this every time I'm using a new project and only figuring out when pushing to the remote server. But git config can do a lot more. One feature you can customize and play with is the alias functionality, which allows you to set any new git command as you wish. Let's see a useful one in action. You know how when you create a new file in a project, they're untracked? If you also make changes and all of a sudden you need to stash them to move to another branch, the changes are stashed, but the new untracked file is still there. As a side note, I would be doing you a disservice if I don't mention the fact that you can use git work trees and forget about stashing and resetting forever, but more on that in the video up here. Back to our stashing issue. Git has the stash minus minus all option and we can create a new alias for that. Let's call it stash with double A. We'll configure it like so. Git config minus minus global alias dot stash and map that to stash minus minus all. And now we run the same thing. That's it. Everything is stashed. We can now move on. This of course works backwards. If I pop the stash changes, both the uncommitted and the untracked files are back. If we check the global config file, you can see how the alias is saved here. Lastly for config, I promised a re 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 intro. So with git config global, re 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 enabled means reuse recorded resolution. The name is a bit mystic, but it is really git magic. Even the docs state that it's a hidden feature. What it does is recording how you resolve certain conflicts and then the next time you encounter them, git will remember and do the thing automatically for you. This becomes very handy with long living branches or casual rebasing and saves you the trouble of fixing conflicts over and over. Showing re 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 is a video of its own so subscribe if you aren't yet because this video is coming soon you can also click the bell notification to be notified when new videos are out so until then let's move on git config is great but when it comes to interrogating changes you can use some cool flags to power the blame command you've probably used git log and if you want my one-liner showing the colorful output with branching representation i'll leave it in the description but what if you want to search an expression within your log? Git log with minus s and an expression like bug 
gives you the commits that contain this expression. If you add minus p, you get a diff containing the search string. Logs are easy. How about getting juicy with git blame? You can run git blame on a file to see the committer is responsible for the mess. And yes, I know this has no syntax highlight like lazy git or NeoGit, but bear with me, we're working purely with the CLI today to make a point. You can add minus w to ignore white spaces, which is often frustrating to see during blames. So if I add a single white space and commit it, I'll be able to see the blame difference with and without the flag. Let's start without it, just for the sake of comparison, and you can see the space is added at the end of the line, and the commit hash ends with 9.2. Obviously it has my name on it, and it's the 9th of April, 3.30pm, which is the time of recording right now. Now, blaming with minus W on a split above, I have the same line, still with a space, but the hash is different. It's an older commit from 4 months ago at 10am. This means that git helps me to see an updated version of the code without the noise of small changes. But we can do better than that, actually way better. You can also ignore code movement. If I open a file and move some code around, no logical change was really made and git is aware of that. I'll commit the change and start with git show head to see the changes. The line that says source to muxinator was moved 4 lines up in the sessionx.sh file. Running a simple blame, I can see the line is in the right place and the new commit I just made appears. 9th of April, around 3.50pm. Let's run blame with minus C. Still the same code, still line 3, but the commit is now from last week, 4th of April, and the hash is different. Another touch of cleaning noise when trying to understand who made critical changes in my codebase. By the way, it gets even better. When this option is given twice, the command detects movement of code to other new files given that they were created in that commit. If given three times, yes, minus C, minus C, minus C, the command will look for copies made across other files in any commit in the history of the project. Up until now, all of the features were not new, but Git is ever evolving and there are some new stuff, the last of which is an absolute killer, starting from Git branches. You already know Git branch, but did you know you can present it in columns? You can also add a sort command, for example based on the committer date, or another logical method. And of course, you can configure everything either globally or project specific if it makes sense. You can now also sign commits with SSH rather than GPG. If you're struggling setting up GPG or just rather use a key that you probably already have locally, Git now offers using the SSH key to sign commits with git config gpg.format SSH, which is kind of funny, but it's a cool feature that I started using. Make sure after configuring the format to add a signing key configuration pointing at the public key you'd like the commits to be signed with. And here's another magical one. Git maintenance start adds a cron job that fixes stuff around your repo, mainly in the object structure and the docs describe it as run tasks to optimize git repository data. Bottom line, this thing speeds up git commands and the way git is utilizing storage under the hood and is mostly noticeable in large repos. You can use the run command to start a certain task like GC for garbage collection or start to start maintenance in the current repo for general action. If you add the minus minus schedule flag, it'll run the same thing on an hourly basis or the current schedule you'll decide. There are a bunch of other configurable options. If you really want to get into it, just go to git dash maintenance in the official docs and knock yourself out. Last but definitely not least, Git has finally made force pushes safe. Yes, exactly. Ever had to rebase, amend, or just force push to a remote branch just to find out later you've overwritten someone else's changes? Well, git push minus minus force with list fixes that problem altogether. This is a safer way to push changes to the remote repo and will simply fail if other changes were introduced that are not yours. The way I use it is I use the first feature from this video by creating an alias git config minus minus global alias dot pfwl which is push force with list push and the full flag. Then I know that even after rebasing I'm safely pushing and no one is gonna come screaming which is basically always how I feel before forcing a push. Back to GitHub's founder and Git Butler. While I have nothing against it, the main feature it offers is called virtual branches. Basically, this is a way to use multiple branches, switch between them, and even apply code from one to another without ever stashing or resetting any branch. And while this is cool, on paper, it comes with a risk. I had a recent viewer working with it and then running a bunch of CLI commands only to find out he lost his virtual branches work. That's the thing with Git Butler and other GUIs. In many cases, they require you to stay within their flow, through their UI, and when it comes to changes, it may be risky. 
So to solve this, Git offers natively one of the greatest features ever. Yes, it won't do everything virtual branches do, but it's embedded into Git and always available to you, and it's called Git Work Trees. It'll keep you safe, working on multiple trees at once, viewing them side by side, never having to stash or reset, and it's a pure joy to work with, especially with the right tooling. Here's a video covering all about that and how you can set it up for yourself with Worktrees for every future project. Thank you for watching and I will see you on the next one.